We live in a time when the, the national narrative is, and this is an oversimplification, but it's that the Democratic Party is good on democracy and the Republican Party is bad on democracy. Yes, I want you to vote, but only if you vote the way I tell you to. There's a trope here in DC that someone like me, I'm a senior, I live in one of the poorest wards in the city, that I can't understand this, that, or the other. And I think it takes someone like me to come out and say, that's bullshit. I've been an independent voter for 10 years. I would say the general attitude is, they don't think about independent voters, especially in a closed primary state. I think there's a there's benign neglect and also a threat. I definitely think the right. parties, the Democratic Party, is threatened by opening the primaries. They 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 can't predict independence. Independents are not understandable using the algebraic formulas that have been developed over the last 50 years. They're literally not. They're they're like a different form of life. And I have to say, I'm talking about the leadership. Um, regular Democrats said, no, we support what you're doing. I'm going to support what you're doing. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for making time in this build up to Halloween. Um, I just wanted to, before I introduce our, our very distinguished panel of discussants today, I just wanted to share a few of my thoughts about kind of what I'm looking to do with this conversation or how I'm approaching it. Um, and you know as we as all of you know we live in a time when the the national narrative is and this is an oversimplification but it's that the democratic party is good on democracy and the republican party is bad on democracy now obviously 150 years ago it was the exact opposite but that's our narrative today you might you might agree with that narrative completely you might agree with it partially, you might think it's overly simplistic, you might completely reject it, that's your prerogative. I'm not actually interested in creating a, an alternative narrative today. What, what I'm hoping we can do together is actually uh, look at what it's like to advocate for open primaries, for the voting rights of independent voters in areas, cities and states of the country that are dominated by the Democratic Party. Looking, in my opinion, it's very different than spinning. And that's what I'm hoping we can accomplish today because the work that we're all doing all over the country is extremely hard. It's difficult. And the better we can, we can recognize both the opportunities and the challenges the better position we are to make change, not not to change the narrative, but actually to change the country uh, and the rules that govern our politics. So let's get right into it. Let me introduce our panel. Um, Sandra Cosgrove is a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada and the executive director of Vote Nevada, which is a nonprofit that promotes civic participation. Uh, legislative advocacy and advancing civil rights. And she's one of the leaders of the current effort to enact open primaries and rank choice voting in Nevada via ballot referendum. Welcome, Sandra. Uh, Dr. Jesse Fields is a physician. She has served the Harlem community for more than 25 years. She is a longtime advocate for political reform and political independence and has been a board member at Open Primaries since 2014. Welcome, Jesse. Uh, Bob Pearls is a former diplomat and a New Mexico state representative, and he's the founder of New Mexico Open Elections, which came within one vote of passing Open Primaries legislation earlier this year. Welcome, Bob. And finally, Lisa Rice is a business leader, uh, a cancer policy advocate, a public speaker, and a leadership mentor. She wears many hats. She's also a board member at Unite America and is one of the founders and leaders of the Make All Votes Count campaign, 
which is currently working to enact open primaries and rank choice voting in Washington, D.C. All four are very thoughtful leaders and builders and are working tirelessly to bring uh, less partisan open systems uh, to their constituents uh, in their in their states and cities. So welcome all of you. Say hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here with you all. Hi. From your nation's capital. All right. Um, so here's how I'd like to start. If, if each of you could just take a minute or two and just briefly describe your organization, what you're doing, and in broad strokes, what's been the response from the Democratic Party uh, to what you're doing? Why don't we start with you, Sandra? Sure. So again, I'm Sandra Cosgrove. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. And as a history professor, I spend a lot of time with my students kind of talking about civic engagement and basic civic processes. But where I live in Clark County, we have a lot of people that move in all the time. So mm -hmm. every election cycle, there's a lot of people who want to know more about how to vote and how to be engaged. So that's what my nonprofit is all about, is just making sure that everybody in Nevada who's eligible to vote can participate. That's always just been my bottom line. So I've worked with the Democratic Party on things like automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, vote centers, and have never, ha never had a problem. Had a problem as soon as I started supporting an independent redistricting commission. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a commission that looked exactly like commissions that the Democrats were proposing in red states. But I immediately got told to be quiet, to stand back, to not advocate for that. And I said no to that. And instead of um, debating me on the merits of the ballot question or the merits of what I was trying to do, it immediately turned into personal attacks against me. And I have to say, I'm talking about the leadership. Um, regular Democrats said, no, we support what you're doing. I'm gonna support what you're doing. But it, it's a lot of, um, she's racist. I actually got removed from being president of the League of Women Voters because I wrote an op-ed criticizing our democratic governor. Um, it's very, um, I get called stupid sometimes, I'm gullible. And that to me is what I tell my students about when I talk about logical fallacies and ad hominem attacks. When the other side feels it cannot debate you on the merits of what you're doing, they're gonna attack you personally. So I just always assume the more you attack me personally, the more you are sure you could not win an argument with me based on the merits of what I'm doing. And so I always just think that way. I must be doing the right thing because boy, they're coming after me. And, and I have enough of a reputation with being honest and open and talking to people that the, my Democratic friends, they support me. They're like, yeah, this is what we support. It's just that leadership component that can sometimes be nasty about things. Got it. That's really interesting. Uh, Dr. Fields, why don't, we, why don't we move over to you? Okay. So um, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. I... Um... As John said, I am a medical doctor in the Harlem community doing primary care and also uh, have been working uh, a lot, doing a lot of grassroots organizing um, around health issues and mental health, creating a mental health. I'm doing this workshop um, and also I'm a big supporter um, and on the board of the All Stars Project, which is a youth development after school really a national program and in New York City, was founded in New York City. Um, and uh, I say that because I consider it part of my, my work in changing the community, changing our world, uh, opening up our democracy, helping people to grow and develop um, all people and particularly in the poor community, the underserved community in Harlem and the Bronx and around New York City. So I have run for public office as an independent. I am an independent and I, you know, I, I really think that's very helpful in terms of my perspective about different issues that I see, including health, mental health, housing, education, that we need, we need new approaches uh, outside of the two party system, outside of the partisan establishment. Um, and I think that nonpartisan elections and political reform is very connected to that. So I ran for office to have run, not, not at all recently, um, but back in when Bloomberg got elected, um, I ran in 2001 and then 2003 for local offices. I ran for Congress and uh, actually against Charlie Rangel um, and different local offices primarily. Um, 
And I was running, not because I had any illusion that I was going to win the election, but I was running to put forth political reforms and to connect them to people in the community around the things that people live with every day. And I found the response, uh, as Sandra was saying, the ordinary people who may be registered Democrat, may not be registered, may be independents, may be registered Republican, ordinary people, certainly, you know, ordinary Democrats out in the community, certainly in the Black community and communities of color, support everybody having the right to vote. I mean, it's it's like instinctual. Uh, right, right. We fought for voting rights, you know, and so we want, we, we that's something that it, we, we just, uh, you know, of course we support. And when you talk to people and ask people, as I have many times on, on the streets, will you sign this petition in support of opening the primaries? Will you, you know, join me in this effort? The response is overwhelmingly yes, positive. And, you know, um, there are some Democrats, elected officials, sort of insiders who say no. Uh, and the response you asked, the response of the Democratic Party was an all out assault. I mean, when open primaries was on the ballot in 2003, uh, there was, you know, a lot of myths, misconceptions, falsehoods propagated about what open primaries would do. It would hurt the black community. It would not let, let allow people of color to be elected. That's all untrue. In fact, it's the opposite. It allows more people of color to be elected on, on the local, local level. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. And um, I think that uh, this is very important. Uh, and I'm glad to be to be involved in, in this effort. Maybe I should stop there. Yeah, thanks. There, there's so much there to unpackage, Jesse. We'll come back to some of that. Um, Bob, uh, tell us what you're doing in New Mexico. Yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. So I served two terms as a Democratic state representative from a swing district. And that really informed a lot of my views of New Mexico politics. Uh, but then as a second career, I served as a U.S. diplomat, and I came back in 2015 serving abroad and found in New Mexico open elections trying to focus on why we had the hyperpartisanship and polarization in Santa Fe and in D.C. And I guess I was at the bleeding edge because back in 2015, 2016, 2017, it was extremely difficult to even move a semi-open primaries bill through the legislature. And I think as I talk more about New Mexico and as we share ideas uh, today, I want to just lay out a couple of things. First off, New Mexico is a completely closed primary state. We have no ballot initiative. Um, it's very lopsided in that all statewide offices, federal delegation, nearly all county uh, offices are all Democratic. So that's one of the reasons I think I was invited today, because we're we have to move legislation through a democratically controlled right. House, Senate and governor. Um, and we're a, one of the few majority minority states. And so if you combine our Hispanic population with a large Native American population and a small black population, we have 51, 52 percent uh, minority uh, majority. So those are the dynamics. We've been able to move legislation through House and Senate committees over the last seven or eight years. And with the help of professional staff, I see Scylla Apchel and Perry Radford with New Mexico Open Elections are on this call. Last time we moved it for the first time through the Senate floor, through a House committee, and as John said earlier, just missed by a voter to moving it onto the House floor and probably having the governor sign it. So that's kind of a quick overview. It seems like there's been some movement in, yes. in New Mexico over the last couple of years. That's great. Um, Lisa, tell us about your current effort in, in Washington and, and, the, and the, uh, the controversy you've been stirring up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Lisa Rice from Washington, D.C. <clears throat> you know, I don't know what's so controversial about wanting to be able to vote, but uh, here we are. Um, here in Washington, D.C., I'm the proposer of the Make All Votes Count Act which has been renamed for um, ballot, um, appearing on the ballot. And by the way, we have been um, certified as a proper ballot initiative and we've negotiated with our board of elections. And so we're just in, we're, with, we're in the waiting period of, you know, we're going to get our petition soon. So we've been through a lot, uh, including, um, 
some delightful things that the Democratic Party has done. Let me start, though, by saying exactly what we're trying to do, which is initiate ranked choice voting in both primary and general elections. And for primary elections, we have about 86,000 independent voters. That's on my voter registration card. It says no party, NP. We want to give those independent voters the opportunity to select a ballot at primary time and vote in whichever party um, primary that they would like to, they would choose to. And right now that would be Republican, Democrat, Green, I believe still um, has about a uh, party status here. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's all we want to do is, you know, stop disenfranchising me, stop suppressing my vote. Um, yeah, so it does. It, it seems that we've ruffled a lot of feathers, including uh, the feathers of the D.C. State Democratic Committee, um, which has filed a suit against the Board of Elections, the city and the mayor, stating that this is not a proper subject matter for initiative. So there were two suits filed against us, only one stands and that will uh, go to court, I believe December 1st. So, hey, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of action here. Um, and I would say similarly to what Sandra is seeing there in Nevada, it is party leadership, local party leadership, that is making some unilateral decisions and actually those at the leadership levels in the wards across the city don't all agree that this shouldn't go forward. And in fact, as a body, they've not even voted on it for those who are in leadership this time. So this suit um, apparently was a unilateral decision by the executive director of the DC State Democratic Party. But here we are. Yeah. So so it wasn't even like everybody in the, well, whatever, the Central Committee or the Politburo, if the, whatever it's called, signed off on the lawsuit. Um, it was the executive, that's interesting. Yes, there's a little kerfuffle here in, in uh, here locally among the, the leadership now of the Democratic Party that uh, that what happened wasn't very democratic. So there you have yeah. it. All right, so here's, here's a broad philosophical question um, that I'm hoping you guys can respond to. Um, you've each referenced in different ways this kind of, the Democratic Party's not monolithic. There's a difference between the formal leadership and the grassroots. So let's just talk about the formal leadership right now. Um, how would you describe how they think about or don't think about independent voters? Because at its core, open primaries is a pretty simple issue. It's saying independent voters should be able to vote. Are, like, what do Democratic leaders think about these independents? Are they afraid of them? Are they interested in getting their votes? Are they terrified? Do they want to ignore them? Like, what's your general sense of the, the, the prevailing attitude towards these independent voters? Go ahead, yeah. Bob. As an independent, I've been an independent voter for 10 years. I would say the general attitude is they don't think about independent voters. I don't think independent voters really are front and center, especially in a closed primary state. I think their primary concern is sounding like they're trying to enfranchise many, many more people, but then making sure that it's just center left, far left, potential voters who they try to enfranchise. So I think it's um, benign neglect. And that's a lot of what we've been about is trying to represent independent voter interests. But frankly, even our group, which is the closest group in New Mexico to represent independent voters, even we are very focused on simply trying to persuade these very progressive, pretty far left groups that semi-open primaries uh, is okay. It's not going to undercut their power. It's going to allow incumbents to vote their conscience. It's not an anti-incumbent bill, kind of along those lines, more than talking about why it's so important to enfranchise independence. 
Can I just um uh yeah respond? I yeah, I, I mean I, I think that, that it's it's nuanced and um but but you know I I agree in a sense that they they're ignoring the independence. I think, but there's also a threat. I think Democrats, the you know, leadership Democrats are threatened by independent voters and by the fact and really don't know what to make of independence. And, you know, you could argue that it would be better in the interest of the Democratic Party to reach out to independents. They're growing numbers around the country. Why not open your primaries and, and campaign and reach out to those people and have them vote for you? But there, it seems like one of the attitudes, which is a strong attitude by the leadership, I think is that independents are a threat. And one example, just a concrete example that I think of is that, uh, you know, independent voting, Jackie Sale appealed to Barack Obama during his, his re-election um, 2012 to, to reach out, to, to reach out to independents, to support some reforms. He had, he was support, he got elected because of the black community and independent voters. That's who came together and put him over the top. He would not have won the primaries in 2008 and been nominated if it hadn't been for open primaries. That's how he got, that's right. how he won. So, right. But he wasn't willing and the Democratic Party I think leadership wasn't willing to reach out to independents. Um, and they thought they could win without independents and they were able to win. But then the following election, we saw who, who won. You know, uh, Trump got elected after Obama. And I think that was in part the failure of, of the party to reach out. So I think there's, a, there's benign neglect and also a threat. I definitely think the right. parties, the Democratic Party's threatened by opening the primaries. They, it, it, they, they can't predict independence. They don't. You know, and and I think that we could also talk about the issue of why is it that they're so, why is it that they're so against independence and you know so against opening the primaries? I mean, I think that's a kind of philosophical question that I'm that I am interested in pursuing as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about nuance, Dr. Fields, and what we see here in D.C. <laughs> is. Um, Yes, I want you to vote, but only if you vote the way I tell you to. And so as an independent, and I am registered independent, just my very existence is, is some sort of a threat uh, because the use of the word independent, it just, it's, it's frightening. I, and I, I don't know why. And especially in DC, we have so many people that have so many reasons and it really doesn't matter why you're registered as an independent, but we, because we are the seat of the federal government, we have a lot of people who vote here, but maintain a status as independent. We have a lot of military here who must register as independent. And then we have a lot of people like me, just plain old Lisa on the street who has changed her mind about being in one party or another and wants to be an independent. Um, and and we are seen, we are seen as a threat. We're also seen as not quite understandable. Like and and one thing that I I would say is over time, and we see as younger people register, more and more of them register as independents. But when I first registered to vote at age 18, I didn't know you could register as anything other than a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, so I chose one. Um, and I and I like being an independent and I will not give up this independence because someone wants to bully me into being a partisan. I, I will fight. I'm I am so primed for this fight. You just don't know. <laughs> so I think I it, so oftentimes you hear about the read machine. So you hear about machine politics. For the political parties, elections are algebraic formulas. There's variables that they plug in and they're known quantities and you do things in a certain way and then you win. And that includes understanding your voters and how to trigger them and how to get them to vote. Independents are a volatile um, it, variable. And so they tend to be swing voters. They tend to be issue driven. They tend to listen to every candidate, not just your side or the other side. And so I think we, 
independents blow up their algebraic formula because they're so vol volatile. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I think it's so, it's so interesting what you all are saying. I think this thing Lisa said about, and, and you're picking up on this, Sandra, they, independents are not understandable using the algebraic formulas that have been developed over the last 50 years. They're literally not, they're, they're like a different form of life. And it strikes me, Sandra, something you were saying when you were introducing yourself was how receptive the Democratic Party was to certain reforms same day voter registration um I, I forget what you were describing but a automatic number, automatic, voter automatic registration. Right. right and yet so threatened by other reforms and it seems to me those that difference has to be related to this hey we support reforms that fit in our logarithms our mm -hmm. algebra as long as they fit inside our existing formulas. But if they don't, we, we're against them. That, because I've always wondered, like, how can you how can you support nonpartisan redistricting in one state and then oppose it in the other? And it's right. like, those states have different algebraic formulas based on their history. But think about a formula, an algebraic formula has an equal sign and what's on this side. The Democratic Party being in charge is on this side. And what they'll say is, is well, we are the good guys. So whatever leads to us being in charge is good for everybody because right. we will do the right thing. So if something does not lead to them being in charge, it automatically should be something bad and not be accepted. Yeah. In a city like New York City, the Democrats benefit from the fact that, they're, that the primaries are closed and the turnout is low. So right. it's Democratic dominated, it's liberal. And if they win the primary and three people vote, they're happy. They 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 won the election and that's how that's their formula is a low they don't have to be account they, it's hard to hold them accountable on all kinds of issues if they're guaranteed they, they just win the primary it's a closed primary young people and others independents can't vote and you know they li i think they like that system i think that's one of the things they're threatened why they're so threatened by opening the primaries rather than not threatened by automatic voter registration or same day voter registration which are not yeah. even things that they particularly pass it's certainly the same thing here in DC, Dr. Fields. Uh, I mean, we see that those who um, go on to win because we are a super majority Democratic BD, big D town, um, those who win the primary, the, those who win the Democratic primary go on to sit in the office. And we have some people sitting in office that have they are literally in there with less than 10 percent of the vote right of, of the eligible vote they get up they get 20 or 30 percent in the primary but remember only 10 maybe 15 maybe 17 depending upon the year 20 25 percent of registered voters even vote in the primary so <laughs> it's right. we had we literally have people sitting uh on mm -hmm. our council who who are who are in there with just thirty percent of the vote, and in their in powerful positions. Oh, by the way, the chair of the committee that if this were a legislative effort, and the reason it is not a legislative effort anymore, the chair of the committee is someone who's sitting in office with only thirty percent of the vote, huh. and so the group that wanted this change had to change strategy. They had legislate, legislation with the city council and they were within one vote. And then that person became chair of the committee that would see it this cycle. So we, you know, we had to change course. And so that's why we're pushing this as a ballot initiative. Got it. Simple. All right, we're gonna open it up for questions. Just a reminder, if you wanna ask a question, just go to the chat, type your name and your state and then just a one sentence summary of what you wanna ask, and then I'll call on you. Um, so we're gonna start out uh, with a question from Greg Blonder in Massachusetts uh, about how to get things going in Massachusetts. Go ahead, Greg. Actually, some people already responded in the uh, DM, which is uh, okay. wonderful. So, so not everyone saw that, but they've recommended uh, working with the Partners in Democracy group. 
Right. Uh, I, I will tell you when I sat down with uh, two members of the congressional uh, delegation here, you know, right now, Massachusetts is a blue state, but about 30 percent vote um, for Trump in the last election. And by all rights, two of our congressmen would be Republicans in the standard two party system. But gerrymandering has made that impossible. And when I've talked to them about what could we do to lead the charge and show that we, too, can have independent gerrymandering and perhaps move towards ranked choice voting, they say we can't do that right now. The time isn't right because look how narrow the uh, the edge is in Congress. And so they just simply won't do that for what they believe are righteous tactical reasons, even though it's on the wrong side of democracy a long time. And I, I put another note in there, too. There was a, a move in the 70s to eliminate the Electoral College, and it was quite close to passing in uh, 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 both the House and the Senate. But in fact, and there was a lot of back uh, negotiations going on, it was actually a black uh, congressmen in cities who didn't want to do it because they believed they had more power under an electoral college to control the outcome of the election, and they wanted to use that power. Can't blame them. They, they were certainly working in a world where they had no power. But that's what happens every time. The short term crowds out the long term good. And so th that's really the question is, how can we focus people on the long term good away from what are valuable short term goals? I mean, you can't argue with the goals, but but the long term is always sacrificed. Got it. Thank you. So, so, th and, th and thank you for people who responded to the DM. I appreciate it. All right, we're going to go to Norman Bernstein in Arizona, who has my favorite kind of question, an existential question. So go ahead, uh, Norman. You there? You got to take yourself off mute. All right, I guess we lost Norman, but I'm going to ask his question for him because I love it. Norm, Norman uh, asked something very simple. Why is the focus of this discussion on democratic areas? Why are we doing this at all? Any, any, uh, I have my ideas, but uh, any, any responses, Bob? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a good time to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, because, because that's the theme here. So the good is that purportedly the Democratic Party is supposed to hold a basic belief system in expanding the vote and expanding the franchise. And so I think that's why we're here today, because it's deeply frustrating when a democratic state with democratically elected officials, in fact, don't want to expand the franchise. So the good is that we should have more in common with a democratically controlled state. The bad is that, um, it sounds like somebody needs to mute. Um, we, got we got it. The, the bad is often that they really just care about protecting their power base. And the flip side of that is they focus on extreme incrementalism. Um, several of the panelists earlier talked about uh, adopting same day voter registration. And we hear in New Mexico all the time, well, you know, let's try four or five years of letting independents change their registration on primary election day, because that's sort of like open primaries and see how that goes. So that's the bad is this is this tendency towards incrementalism. And then the ugly really is progressive groups being very effective at spreading misinformation like open primaries discriminate against communities of color, uh, lead to more mass incarceration and so forth. Well, I'd like to jump in too because yeah, yeah. so I work with community college students. Many of them are passionate about issues, don't necessarily know if they want to join a party, but they want to be involved. But do you know what it does to them when they watch what the Democratic leadership does to their professor and, and accuses me of being racist and accuses me of all kinds of things that I've done and they attack me? And then my students say, why would I want to join a party that's hypocritical like that that would, that would attack you? And so I tell my Democratic friends, you're not hurting me. I'm just going to keep going along. You're hurting yourself and you're hurting your party by allowing this type of behavior. Just to add my two cents here, I think one of the reasons that we at Open Primaries were interested in, in, in organizing this discussion is there's th this movement is exploding. There, there are people all over the country 
in red, blue, and purple areas, as much as I don't even like that taxonomy, let's use it for a minute, that are saying the exclusion of independence is a problem. We need structural reform, open primaries, and many other reforms. And I, I think one of the challenges is navigating the fact that our political environment has been divvied up between two parties, and it's hard to do. And so, I'm, I, again, I said this at the beginning, I'm not looking to create a narrative of, oh, Republicans good, Democrats bad, or vice versa. It's more how do we as a movement navigate the fact that the parties have divided up the country. And a lot of us don't live in, two, in a two-party system. We live in a one-party system, whether it's Republican only or Democratic only. And that presents particular challenges for making change to the system. And I, I, I hope this can contribute the slightest bit to our sophistication of being able to operate in these different environments. All right, uh, we have a question from Jerry uh, Hen Henage. Uh, about the different forms of open primaries. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, um, I think we've all seen the- uh, Where are you the, from, Jerry? Tell us where uh, you're from. Sorry, I'm from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So we've all seen the, uh, hopefully we've all seen the new uh, election system that Alaska uses, the top four primary, nonpartisan primary, and then uh, using ranked choice voting on the on the four candidates in the November election. And it seems to do most of the things that we want to do. It gets everybody into the primary system. Everybody gets a chance to vote. And, uh, and on top of that, and this is, I think, equally important, it gives us more and better candidates going through to November. And we can just think about the Alaska situation where Lisa Murkowski would have been knocked off if there was the old classic, uh, you know, partisan primary. Um, but she got through. Um, and not only did she win, but the voters won because they had more choices, ones that were they were happier with, you know, because clearly they, they voted her through. So, you know, we're, we're talking about opening up the primaries and Pennsylvania has closed primaries today. So, you know, I'm entirely with you there, but I think we all should recognize that that's just, I believe, just a small step to what we should be doing with the, uh, you know, top four, top five nonpartisan primary and then rank choice voting in November. And I would uh, welcome uh, anybody's comments on that thought. Yeah, Jerry, yes, uh, exactly. You got it. What we wanted to do in DC was uh, the final five model, but our home rule charter prevents that. Our home rule charter actually um, calls for partisan, you have to have a partisan uh, general election. And so there, so that somebody needs to take on that fight <laughs> to change the home rule charter. In the meantime, this is the best we can do and, and we need to make this change. And so we are happy to do that. Um, and, uh, but you're, but you're right, Jerry, that, that would be, you know, that's like, yay, that's the, ch that's the Sunday with the cherry on the top. Uh, right now we're, we're just trying to get like the chocolate sauce with, <laughs> yeah. you know, getting these independents to try, you know, uh, we, 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 we have, we have to be enfranchised. There's so much talk here in DC about, enfranchising different groups. And in fact, uh, we have legislation that has passed and um, non-citizens will be able to vote in local elections here in DC. That was legislation pushed by the same person who does not want to see me as a registered independent vote. So we've got big problems here. So you're right, Jerry, but we're, we're doing step-by-step step as we can. Right. Well, and, and and you break up a good point. I mean, um, where you, in places where you are dependent on these sitting legislators or or you know uh, leaders in in D.C. in this case, 
where you're dependent on them to make change, it's really hard. The areas I think we have the best opportunities are those states or localities where the voters have, you know, uh, citizens initiatives uh, and those types of opportunities. And that's how Alaska got it through. And that's how, cross your fingers, Nevada may get the top five, you know, through as well is, uh, you know, and when you've got, you know, impediments like the, uh, you know, having to change a home rule charter or, you know, or other things that require legislators to make some changes, then, you know, I, I see that as fruit that's further, further out. Let's get the easy pickings in those states that, you know, that uh, offer us some opportunities. Well, we yeah, are excited about the ballot initiative. Sorry, John, but, you know, yeah, yeah, just, just one thought to put in there, and I certainly, I, I fully support and, and actually hope that people have their opinions about which policy is the, is the ideal, is where, is, the, is where you want to get to. I think that's smart and that's fine. I also want there to be some recognition that not everybody has the same opinion about that. There are people, one of them is on this call, Gary Sass in Rhode Island, and what they've gone through in their local process is say no we want to do what they did in california and washington we want to do top two that's going to work best in rhode island other people in oklahoma are saying that other folks are looking at colorado and saying hey if if as a first step we can get independents to vote in the party primaries let's see what the impact is there and i think it's important to recognize how each of these positions is valid there is not a hierarchy. If we create a hierarchy of my position is more legitimate than yours, we're gonna slow down the growth of this movement. We need to create space and an environment for all these diversity of opinions to be respected. And that's something I believe in very strongly. Pragmatically, it's gonna help our movement grow if we have lots of different ideas about how to grow it. I, I agree. I mean, you gotta take what you can get. You can't... Uh... Perf don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. All right, let's go to our next question here. Uh, we're going to um, Kiana, who has a question, a, a tough question about transforming state election law. Go ahead, Kiana. Kiana, you there? You got to take yourself off mute. Uh, sorry, sorry that's, I'll, that's all right. I'll make this quick. So I put this question in the chat, actually, um, because I've heard something about ballot initiative states where citizens can get like questions put on the ballot to be passed. And I was wondering, well, if people in the panel know about it and I don't know, if they tried strategies of trying to make their stay into a ballot initiative one. Hmm. Is she asking how to how to get the ballot initiative process in the Yeah, state? I think it's how to create how to I mean 24 states allow initiative and referendum, right. 26 right. states don't. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting to understand the history of the initiative or referendum and the recall. Those are all progressive reforms that the progressives tried to get in as many state constitutions as possible to fight against Gilded Age corruption, just the how bad corruption was over about 100 years ago. And so it was kind of whatever states had it then still have it now, and the states that didn't, didn't. But you're going to have to, it's, a, it's like a two-step process now. You're going to have to find enough people to put through your legislature and figure out what your constitutional amending process is, because people who are in power don't want you to have the initiative power yourself that takes that power away from politicians. So you've got to get enough people who get, can get elected to then be able to amend your state constitution. I would say elect more young people. They're willing to change, change things a lot faster than us old bogeys are. I just wanted to mention, which I didn't, which I meant to, that in New York City, we do have initiatives. So there is an effort right now that's going on in New York, final five voting, which would give uh, an open prime, a nonpartisan primary in the in the primary, and then ranked choice voting in the general five, top five, 
in the general. And Sal Albanese is leading an effort to get it on the ballot. It's tough. There's a lot of signatures required. The city council can actually remove it, and then you have to get even. Then you have to get more signatures. So for next year, they're they're at, they're going for it. And I have endorsed it. I've supported it. Uh, Open primaries are supporting it. Andrew Yang and others, Forward Party, ha are supporting it. So it's going to be a hard, you know, road, challenging. But but it is. I did want to mention that it is there. That's happening. Yeah, and John, I've got I've got a quick comment. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of states that don't have citizen initiative, like New Mexico, it turns out any municipality in New Mexico can pass ranked choice voting with a simple bill introduction of a city council and a mayor's approval. Um, so uh, Utah, on the other hand, needed uh, statewide legislation to authorize ranked choice voting. So I would urge all of you to look to see what's going on in your state and to see if you can already work with localities to pass ranked choice voting, because then that adds impetus um, to be able to pass such a bill at the state level. And that's an approach we're starting to take. Great. Uh, we're gonna go to Kathy Stewart, who has a question about the cultural implications of building campaigns. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, thanks, John. So great to um, have this conversation together. When I was thinking about all of the obstacles that we face, and the, the very eloquent and very accurate ways you guys have described what it's like to do this in Democratic Party strongholds. In some ways, we could, we could just flip the script a little bit and then flip some of the narrative use, but the same thing goes on in Republican Party strongholds. I see some, some colleagues in Arizona, a state that I've, that I've done a lot of work in over the years. Um, but one of the things I keep thinking about is that 47% of Americans have decided that this two-party system isn't working, right? And they're leaving the party. Even though in many states, that means we can't vote in primaries, so we're not decision makers. Even though we can't be poll watchers, there's so many ways we're discriminated against. Perhaps the most important way I think independents are sidelined is a cultural statement that gets made that we're not real. We're closet partisans. We can't make up our minds. You know, like there's a million ways we're categorized to literally obfuscate and pull a screen down over the fact that the country's going through a huge set of crises, mainly a crisis in confidence that our government can solve any of our problems and Americans are making moves. So I, I wanted to ask all of you, how do you, how do you think about building that coalition that brings that statement and independence really to the table and to the fore. Um, I know that many of these fights are many years, they're long-term. Sandra, you've been, you, you guys are in now year, you have to go two rounds and there's all the particularities, but then there's this whole cultural dynamic and dynamism to bring to the fore. And I just wanted to ask people to talk about how you're, how you're building with that on the ground. Kathy, um, I think here in DC, it's a matter of um, leading by example. And for me, you know, I have, I, there's a trope here in DC that someone like me, I'm a senior, I live in one of the poorest wards in the city that I can't understand this, that, or the other. I can't, I don't know how to rank my vote. I don't, you know, all of the, it's it really vicious, outdated, ar archaic tropes. And I think it takes someone like me, a black woman, a senior to come out and say, that's bullshit. And my team that I'm working with there are only two, well, of our steering committee, I'm the only independent, the rest are registered Democrats. And one of them um, wrote an amazing, our treasurer wrote an amazing article about coalition building and about what DC Democrats might be able to do if they were only open to independence here. Um, and so it, it takes, you know, it, it takes someone stepping out and I was watching, when you were asking your question, I was watching the chat because people were talking about being closeted independence. It takes us coming out of the closet and saying, hey, 
I'm an independent, I matter, my vote matters. And I get shouted down by people who tell me, look, you join the Democratic Party and then you'll be fine. No, I say, no, this is my constitutional right not to. And it has to be said again and again and again and again. And I don't, that's how it is here in DC. Yeah, that's that's really uh, beautiful. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I think that's such a wonderful question. And I appreciate what Lisa was saying. I think, you know, this is something that um, we can work on every day when we go out. I'm really, uh, I love doing grassroots organizing. And I think there's, you know, uh, talking to people and it's it's people who are independents and also people who just feel so disconnected from the system and from, you know, from politics and have stopped voting. For instance, talking to young people in the African-American community and poor communities. And so what I, I think it's important to be positive and engage them in a process, just being out and talking to people. And, you know, when I've run for office and really I do this whenever I, I spoke at a church this past Sunday, trying to connect people and inspire people that the, the way things are does not have to be the way they continue to be. And we can create coming together community, we can build together, we can, uh, we're can we involved in, in movements, continuing to be involved in movements. So people who have been marginalized on the outside, such as independents, you know, they're saying they're, you know, they're like 2% independents. You're not really independents, you lean Democrat or Republican. This is part of that, that cultural dismissal of independence, but, but recognizing the leadership role that people who have been marginalized outsiders, certainly the black community and others have in leading the country and bringing people together. So trying to inspire people and to continue those movements which have shaped our country in positive ways. So I try to convey that. And I think that that's, that that's important that we have that spirit that independent spirit of organizing people, building community. It, you know, these fights are long-term. We have to be on a long-term path. And I think that's that's part of it is bringing people together and continuing to fight, continuing to build and continuing to struggle to go forward. Because I think this is in fact, the hope of our communities and of our country as a whole. So I have a simple strategy, be Spock, not Kirk. No matter, <laughs> no matter what, respond with logic, not emotion. All right. It works. If you're not the person that's flying off the handle and, and screaming and yelling, people notice that difference. And I just, I just keep preventing the, the arguments, presenting why I think this is a good idea. And in the long term, it, it's evident that you're not the one that's kind of unhinged. That's good advice. All right. We're going to go to Quinton Wilson in Missouri, who has a question about facilitating conversation within the reform movement. Go ahead, Quinton. Yes, thanks, John. And this just proves how open this kind of discussion is because I have, I told John I had a slightly different take on, on the uh, uh, let a thousand flowers bloom strategy, uh, j just whatever any state wants to do. I don't disagree with that. Obviously, elections in, under the Constitution are still state run. But I think I, I was at the American Dem Democracy Summit in Los Angeles a few weeks ago. And I, up until that point, I, and I'm a member of Forward Party and No Labels. And even though they don't agree with everything together, they're both very focused on democracy reform. And I was really convinced of ranked choice voting, or I lived in California for about 10 years, uh, top two. And just uh, there was in the chat a question about what, how's it four out of five different from top two? And, uh, and, and I, and I, there, there was a, somebody has a, a very good, I, I haven't found it, very good YouTube video on that. But I became convinced when I learned about the different options that 405, the four out of five is a good, 405 comes from living in LA, sorry about that. But the four out of five really is about, is, is a really good strategy, uh, at least in my mind. And I thought, and what I was suggesting is, uh, asking is if open primaries could facilitate a discussion. I think there's a lot of learning to be had about these different approaches. I thought I knew about, most of them, and I was supportive of them, and yet I was learning uh, in that large group of people committed to democracy reform about new options. So I just wondered what what you all thought about having a facilitated discussion, kind of an education about what these options mean. Some people are shooting at 
frank choice voting and i don't think they really understand frank choice voting if they did we had a discussion informing people and letting them uh you know say what well what are you really trying to achieve my goal is that everybody can vote for in the election that actually elects somebody and that's not happening so i mean that's just my you know, how i would define the result yeah. I mean, here, I'll, I'll just respond how we think about it at open primaries, and others have the right to think about it differently. I, I'm not trying to say this is the right way, but this is how we think about it, is that we think that, that in many ways, reform cannot be understood as this policy or that policy. Reform is the process of the citizenry retaking control of their democracy. That is what it is. And the more that we obsess about the technicalities of the particular tools and tactics that we use, the further and further we get from recognizing that fundamental dynamic. So what we do is we really encourage and support people, citizens, taking back control of their democratic process, using the tactics and tools that make sense where they live. They can take inspiration from other states. Everybody doesn't have to start from scratch, of course. That's ridiculous. And that's happening. People look at Alaska and they say that's that that would work here. Other people look at California and say that would work here. Other people, the folks in Oregon said none of these models work. We have to invent our own because of, of unique local circumstances. The power of reform is the citizenry, not the tools and the tactics. So is that, a, is that an argument that we should never talk about tools and tactics? No, of course not. We should always be educating and involving. But it, it's got to be secondary to the fundamentality of our role as citizens of grabbing the reins and retaking our democratic process. That's how we think about it. Other people think about it differently. And they certainly have the right. Um, Any thoughts or? Um, yeah, okay? go ahead. I guess I would just mention that those of us who think about this day in and day out probably have our favorite books. And for me, Catherine Gell's book, The Politics Industry, has become one of our Bibles. I think it's a really concise explanation of the issues, the problems, a possible solution. In her case, it's top five, but it's a great narrative, and I would urge everybody to read it. I would want to say, reinforce what, what John said, and, and to say something, not to lose sight of why we're having this conversation. We all agree that the primary system has to be reformed because it's the best example of voter suppression. And there are different ways to deal with voter suppression in each state. In the state I come from, the Constitution says that the elected person is the one that receives a plurality of the vote. Well, I have to work reform around that constitutional provision because there's no way I can amend the Constitution in the next decade. It takes 10 years to historically amend the Constitution. The second point, which we haven't discussed, and I think it really gets back to the theme of this call about how you deal in democratic strongholds. And I put the Republican Party aside for a minute. And I'm a registered Republican. I've been Republican for a long time, not been active since I was a policy advisor to cases and you know what happened you know, with that. So that party is acting like a cult right now. Democratic party is not still acting like a political party. So what, you know, why is it difficult for reformers to work in a democratic state? And I come back to something which may disagree with, but I think it, it gets back to how the democratic party today is practicing identity politics. And there's something they call intersectionalism. And you can see the intersectionalism uh, in an issue that's not even related to what we're talking about today, but in the reaction of some democratic groups to the, what's happening in, in the Middle East right now and the response to the, <clears throat> what, the, the, the terror that Hamas brought. Uh, <clears throat> you know, where different elements of the party do not want to offend or cross over this intersectional line, so they're quiet. And the party begins to lack moral faith as a result. And so I think in dealing with, with uh, the stronghold, particularly of the democratic states, uh, we have to figure out a way 
in how we deal with disidentity politics. And I don't have an answer to that question, but I just see that fundamental to everything. Because I have a lot of conversations um, with the Democratic leadership in the state, from the Speaker of our House to the President of our Senate, who were very interested in what we were talking about. But when they have to go back to their caucus, it's as bad as the Republican caucus and electing a speaker. It's like a wow. tower of Babel. And to me, that seems to be the problem that's slowing down a kind of, uh, if, if not factual, an honest conversation you know, with the leadership of the party. And nothing's gonna happen until the leadership of the party feels that they don't have to make every decision based on what I call this intersectionalism. And I, I, I think that I don't have an answer. I don't think any of us have an answer to that problem. Yeah, that's, so, that's, a, that's the problem. It is, and it's a challenge. And we could do a whole nother discussion about our identity politics and, and where that's left us as a country. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, this hour went by very quickly. I wanna thank all of you. And I'm sorry I couldn't get to all the questions, um, but we ran out of time. Uh, thank you, Bob, Jesse, Sandra, Lisa. Uh, two quick announcements before we, we wrap up. One is that our next virtual discussion, we're gonna be talking with a group of college students from Pennsylvania that have built a statewide committee of young people that are working to enact open primaries in Pennsylvania. It's a really organic and um, snowballing effort among college students throughout the state uh, we're going to talk with them. That's coming up on November 16th. And connected to that, uh, we just launched today um, a fundraising campaign to raise $100,000 to support the folks in Pennsylvania. We have a $50,000 matching gift. Um, we launched that today. If you haven't given in a while, please give at Open Primaries. Every dollar is being matched and it's going to support a very important effort to pass Open Primaries in Pennsylvania. So thank you for participating. Thank you, panelists, and we'll see you next month. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Peace. Thanks. Thanks. Good to see everybody. Take care. Thank you.